so today we will talk uh, more about uh, objects where the appreciation is important, but mostly paying attention not to the way how the appreciation proceeds, but rather to the uh, sources of uh, material, which is quite uh, complicated. Some of the things mentioned uh, today will not be discussed in, in detail because uh, theoretically they are too complicated, so we will not uh, discuss those things which are too complicated. And uh, actually, stellar formation is, belongs to those much more complicated processes we will not uh, discuss in, in, in detail during the, the remaining uh, lectures. On the other hand, this is quite important, right? Because uh, star formation and planetary system formation, this is one of the hottest topics in, in astronomy. So formation of a star happens from the collapse of the protostellar cloud and that we know that's simple, but then uh, everything becomes more, more complicated because we have to, 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 to compress somehow the star and the initial impulse, impulse for the compression is not quite clear. Anyway, the process of the formation also proceeds in a very different way in the case of massive stars and low mass stars. So in the case of massive stars, uh, we do not see much. The collapse uh, is uh, kind of hidden from, from us. We see the star shining only when it's ready. So maybe an accretion disk uh, forms during this stage, but we do not see it anyway, because everything is somehow too obscured. Uh, on the other hand, in, in the case of formation of less massive stars, uh, we can observe uh, those phases. And uh, for example, if we observe what is happening of, of in, in Taurus molecular, cloud or in uh, Orion Nebula, we see some young stars here. I, I listed a few most uh, studied like HL Tauri, DG Tauri or GW uh, Orioni. And in the case, in large uh, number of, of cases in high proportion, actually a binary star then <coughs> forms. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, and I explained that the, the pointer, of course, is visible only to you. It's not visible online, but uh, next week I will have something which will be also visible online. Something like new so software, special, whatever, fancy. So we will see how it's working. So the, the, the issue is not uh, new and uh, some numerical simulations, how this process uh, proceeds uh, were done many, many years ago. Here you have a numerical SPH uh, simulation from Lubov and Artemovich 1996. And you see that material mostly surrounds the, the newly formed binary star, but still uh, and matter flows also directly towards the, towards the stars. So in the past we had to rely on, on theory. Now, apart from uh, more uh, advanced numerical simulations, in many cases we can see how this uh, new star looks like. And here you see images, those are real images of uh, newly born stars uh, uh, surrounded by the uh, accretion disk. It's partially outflowing, I think partially inflowing. Uh, planets can, can form there. This is the image 
uh, possible to obtain using Atacama large millimeter array shortly ALMA, which is located in Chile at uh, height 5,000 meters, more or less. So the air is dry and you can do observations even at uh, a fraction of, of, of millimeter to resolve the, the, the image, to, to, to see the situation more clearly, right? And longer wavelength, the image is not so well resolved. In Poland, uh, we cannot observe in millimeter wavelength because of too much water vapor. So, as I mentioned already, in a function of uh, cases, uh, what forms is actually a binary star. So, statistically, about 70% of stars, at least in the solar vicinity, are in the form of binary stars. Usually, the, the period is pretty long, like over 100 years. And not all of them come in contact. So then after the uh, formation stage, there is uh, no active accretion in most of those uh, situations. But in the case of about 1%, uh, the star, finally, those two stars exchange mass between themselves. And this is the accretion process which will be of interest for us in later parts of, 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 of the lecture. So basically it, it happens in two cases. One case is that uh, you have to consider the equipotential surfaces around the binary system and we will do some uh, considerations in a minute on the next slide. So qualitatively, you can expect that, yes, from at large distance, you see the binary star as a point like source, so it looks equipotential surfaces are just circles. But there are also positions where the particle can be in balance between the attraction force between those two stars. So there is one uh, extremely important equipotential surface. This is the Roche lobe or Hill sphere. Um, I'm not sure what in, in astronomy most people say Roche lobe. In Wikipedia, it's Hill sphere. I think Hill considered that before Roche, but somehow, you know, some things happen later customarily. So those equipotential surface, if this, this particular equipotential surface forms a kind of eight here on this diagram and it crosses here in this point. So if, for example, and we have here this drawn schematically, if the star expands and becomes large enough to fill this Roche lobe, then the material will flow on the other to the other side. And this is one very important uh, in case of mass transfer, which we will discuss in a minute in more detail. And then the second case is when the star does not quite feel the Roche law, but it's not too far from it. And if the star has a wind, this, this uh, blue thing imitates the, the, the wind, I'm not really artistic, if there is a wind, then the, the companion can intercept a part of this wind, and we can have uh, an accretion like this. So in order to, to uh, consider this in, in detail, we have to do some mathematics, but this mathematics is relatively simple, and I think it's good to do it not in in 3D because that's too complicated. But uh, we have to just uh, discuss what is happening along the symmetry axis. So now the situation is like that. We have one star, we have the second star, actually 
for some reason this star which is now size uh, larger as for the size this is n2 and this smaller one is m1 and this will be clear later why why such uh, statement and this is the symmetry axis and those stars of course they rotate right because otherwise stars would collapse immediately so we assume that they are on uh, circular orbits that means that whole this axis rotates right so this small mass is on that orbit and this large mass is on that orbit but they rotate always to be on opposite side of the center of mass so the center of mass here is the important concept because this is the point which is in the rest frame from the point of view of the system or at least uh, all forces um, can be uh, described with respect to this point in, in general of course the whole binary can move around the galaxy or whatever but if we consider the, the circular motion it's enough to consider it with respect to the center of mass and from the definition of the center of mass here you have the the definition from uh, Wikipedia. This is uh, the point where uh, forces balances, unless we want to uh, discuss uh, external forces. So the center of mass from the definition, if you calculate, and if you note A as the distance between the two stars, then this part is a times n2 divided by the sum of mass and this is n1 divided by the sum of mass of course if those two masses are equal then the center of mass uh, is in the middle between those two stars so everything rotates around the center of mass but this point l1 which will be of interest this one, this is usually notified as L1 point, the balance of forces between those two stars. This is not the same as the center of mass. This point describing balance of forces will be somewhere here. And we will notify this as X. Now we have to do some kind of mathematics. So we have to calculate the forces here in this uh, L1 point, we are, we are looking for it, for this value of x. So we consider the forces. As I told you, center of mass does not rotate, but this point does rotate, right? It does rotate. So then we have the following forces. First, if we have a test particle here of this mass m small which will later cancel it does not matter then this is the attraction gravitational force by mass m2 this is the gravitational force by mass m1 but there is also a centrifugal force because of this rotation we consider co-rotating system And it's important also to know what is the angular momentum of the whole uh, system. And this can be shown easily from the uh, balance of, of, of forces and Keplerian motion that the angular velocity is like in the case of a single star. So here is the distance between those two stars and here is the sum of the mass. So here in this equation, if you put the angular velocity, sorry, not angular momentum, angular velocity, of course. If you put this value there, you can calculate the position of L1 you solve just this equation for x or a minus x, whatever. 
and then you, you, you determine the Lagrange point. Of course, in, in, in general, you should repeat easily uh, the same for to get the external uh, point L3, which is also, uh, there is also a, a false balance because here you have an attraction by two masses. On the other hand, because this is a rigid rotation, then this force becomes large. So it can compensate. And you have also L2 point determined in the same way. All those points are unstable. So if you perturb this, the, the, the particle, here it's obvious. You, you perturb it, and then it will fall either towards this star or towards the other star. Here, those points are also unstable. There are two more points which are not along the symmetry axis. So to get those, you have to do really advanced modeling. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Just a small question. In the previous. Uh, uh, OK. Yes. yes. I don't remember the calculations. But for the angular uh, velocity. For the angular velocity. Shouldn't we have the reduced mass? Because uh, when I remember that the relative degrees of freedom are an effective Hamiltonian with the reduced mass. And so something like that. Maybe in the end something happens, but. Uh, I'm not sure at this point, because then if I try to derive everything, it yeah. will be quite <laughs> slow. A, yeah. But it's, it's a good question. Maybe we can explain that on the on on, on the next lecture. Yeah, maybe because okay. I'm I'm not absolutely sure. I think I'm correct, but you know I derived those formulae uh, a couple of years ago, and now I copied it, so I don't really remember. But okay, it's a warning to you that it's better to 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 check what I'm writing, right? No, oh, maybe in the end. It it ends up being uh, what, what you wrote. But uh -huh. in my mind, I had this idea that they should uh, take the reduced mass. Uh -huh. So one over, yes, one yes. over, plus yeah. one Maybe. over. Maybe. <laughs> I wouldn't put now much money into any of those two options. They, are, they, they, they look reasonable. Mm -hmm. OK, OK, but we can. OK, we can, <laughs> we can <laughs> check that. Check for yourself, and I, I will check, 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 and then we will make sure what's the what's the situation good point look at my hands because i i make a lot of mistakes so in in general equation equations look pretty complicated you should discuss the motion in 3d using this kind of potential i'm not entering into into this thing and then you can uh, reconstruct additional uh, Lagrange points as in the case of previous <coughs> situation. This, this cannot be done without doing this kind of exercise. Anyway, for most of the, of the discussion, uh, just the, 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 the inner Lagrange point L1 will be uh, important for us. And what is uh, important immediately, I told you that the center of mass will be somewhere else, right? So then this inner Lagrange point is also rotating. If it is rotating, then you can immediately guess that the string of material, if the star feels this rush slope, will not fly directly towards the second star because the, the Coriolis force will be in action. So then it will flow like this because this point has certain angular momentum. And this is very important. Of course, if those two masses are identical, then yes, the flow will be just directed towards the, the second star. But, but usually that does not. So now we want to know something more 
about the, this uh, character of the motion. What will happen with this stream? Whether this will, stream will hit the star, the second star, or it will form an, an accretion disk, something like that. So for that, in principle, you should solve all those equations and then to determine the shape of this Roche law, right? But astronomers usually do not require very accurate things, at least for a rough discussion, this kind of uh, accuracy is not required. Uh, so there are two simple formula where you consider a spherical cow, I mean, that this surface is actually spherical. And then the, the radius, the ratio of this radius of this sphere to the star separation is given by such formula. It's just 0 0.462 times N2 divided by the masses and then in the power one third. And then that formula was invented by uh, Paczynski in 67. It's very simple and we will use this, this formula. It's not very accurate. A bit later, uh, Eagleton proposed a formula which is uh, more complicated, but then it really works su su surprisingly well for a large range of uh, mass ratios almost from zero to infinity, where this mass ratio is n2 to n1. So this formula is, is better if you want to have uh, precise uh, results, but that is numerically simple and we will use it uh, in a minute to, uh, to get uh, uh, what to get the information about the, 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 the later character of this uh, motion of the stream. So we have to do the second uh, assumption that again, the, this motion is not a hydrodynamical flow of the stream, but it is a motion of a single test particle. This is an assumption, but it's not a bad assumption because the flow is actually transonic here and supersonic here. And supersonic flow is usually well described in test particle approximation till the moment when shock forms, of course. So we can uh, qualitatively, we can guess that because the, there is certain angular momentum of the flow here, this material will have this angular momentum. Well, it will not settle immediately on a circular orbit because it has too high energy. So it would be an elliptical orbit, whatever. At the beginning, you have to lose energy. But uh, uh, if you calculate the, the angular momentum, just angular momentum, and assume that the energy will adjust, then you can predict what is the radius which the material will form. This is so-called circularization radius. And the circularization radius thematically drawn here. This is not how it happens that the situation, real situation is far, far more complicated. But using the, the formula of, of Paczynski and considering the uh, angular momentum balance. So this is the angular momentum here in the motion around the star, right? This is the omega which was before. Now we consider the, the, how this angular momentum looks like from the point of view of circular motion. And that would be omega k, which is the angular momentum uh, in Keplerian orbit around M1 star. So you see, it's a simple uh, consideration. And using this formula by Paczynski, this is why 
it's simpler. With that one, you cannot do much. With that one, you can calculate very easily nice final expression for the circularization radius. It still looks quite uh, complicated, but if you assume certain mass ratio of uh, M1 to M2 or a few, few experiments, then you will see that actually this circularization radius is more or less by a factor two, three smaller than A in many cases. So this, this picture is, is more or less correct with respect to proportions. So when we get rid of the energy, the material will form here a ring. But of course, here we have a collision between the stream and the ring. And additionally, if in this ring a viscosity starts to act, then the redistribution of the angular momentum takes place. So part of the angular uh, part of the matter will lose angular momentum and will uh, the orbit will spring and shrink and the material will, will approach the central star. On the other hand, the remaining angular momentum will be carried by the remaining matter, which will be slightly expanded. So what will happen is actually you will form an accretion disk around the central star, this M1 star. And this uh, material flows in. Initially, it flows out as well because it uh, 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 preservation of angular momentum requires that. But finally, this material will become quite close to this Roche law. And then, you know, this approximation of spherical symmetry is not uh, valid. And then tidal forces will take this extra angular momentum to the orbital angular momentum. So finally, uh, the, the disk will form, which will be larger than the circularization radius. And there will be a kind of, of balance. So the outer radius will be set by this uh, tidal forces uh, balance. And in computations, this has to be taken into, into uh, account. So this is how the disk can, can form and those Accretion disks, usually without this part, we will discuss a lot during the next few lectures. Uh, Vishal, I have a question. Uh, so with this tidal force inter uh, interaction, uh, the symmetricity of the disk will change? Uh, yes, it's, the, like, yes, it's a, yes, so it's slightly elliptical at the outer uh, edge. And it also gets shifted towards uh, the, the portion which is closer to the Lagrangian point one gets more extended because of the yes so this is because the rotation of the disk is not <coughs> rotating with whole system so this is how tidal forces come into into play because you have this uh, let's say elongation but this elongation moves so you have to dump this elongation create new elongation yes it's quite complicated but uh, it's quite important for cataclysmic variables. Okay, so now uh, the situation in that uh, final situation uh, depends whether the central star is small or or not. I, uh, for, for the, when I was talking about an accretion disk, I assumed that the circularization radius is much larger than the radius of the of the star, right? This is if if the star is a white dwarf or a neutron star, this is a kind of obvious. On the other hand, the secondary uh, uh, wrong direction. The second star can be large main sequence star. It also happens. So if this star is much larger than the circularization radius, then the stream will just hit the, the, the stellar surface. 
nothing much actually happens then because then you know then the, the radius of the star is large i told you efficiency of accretion is not then large no. but there are such systems for example this is uh, uh, a picture of uh, algal type uh, uh, binary <laughs> which i borrowed from from this guy so you see this this star fills the Roche lobe. This is not much smaller, and and the stream just hits the, the the surface of the star. Of course, it affects the, the eclipses. There is some kind of ejection, a bit of mess here, but in general, it just looks like that. And we will not discuss those objects because we will concentrate on accretion disks and simple and nice uh, things. So now when we understand already how this mass exchange uh, works, we have to determine the time scale and the direction of the changes. So there is one, one uh, case which is simple to uh, consider. This is so-called conservative evolution. Conservative means that there is no mass loss and no angular momentum loss from the system. In many cases, this is not true because if you have a stellar wind, you lose both mass and angular momentum, and then you cannot do nothing or at least uh, uh, using simple analytical formula. But we will assume uh, conservative uh, evolution. That means, of course, the, 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 the mass two is uh, going down, mass one is going up, but the total mass is conserved. And also the angular momentum is conserved. We will assume that. So then we have to differentiate those equations. If you differentiate, then this thing does not appear and you have derivatives of the masses and derivatives of this uh, uh, omega and this omega was so again it's quite important what is this omega whether it's this or not Oops, sorry which is So I think I was using this definition. If not, then no. everything else will... I have done the calculation and yes. it is correct. It is correct. Because uh, <laughs> in the gravitational force, there is the product of the masses, which uh -huh. cancels uh, the, and the um, reduced mass becomes, uh, in the end, the sum of the masses. So okay, it, it, great. I think great, because <laughs> then I use the derivative of this and derivative of, 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 of the this and then I, I use this prescription for the uh, potential and I connect the derivative of uh, this radius two to derivatives of the of the masses, right? So there is quite a number of computations to be done, but nothing very mysterious. And the interesting part is that you come to the following formula which if you uh, introduce again this mass ratio q equal mass two to mass one, you see that you have here a factor of five per five six minus q. So this is the derivative of the of the radius. The mass of n2 decreases, so this is negative. So now you see that everything depends whether this mass ratio initial mass ratio or current mass ratio is larger than uh, five six or smaller because uh, if this uh, value is smaller then this is positive right Yes, so this is positive, not negative. I, I confuse something on an explanation, but the rest is, is correct. If it is positive, 
then the star is growing. So if you go back to this picture, star which already was feeling its row slope is not now even bigger. So the flow happens even more rapidly, right? It's something wrong with those signs. M2 by M1, so. So what, what is possible with, with those uh, signs? Help me. So if Q is smaller, then this is positive. This is negative, but this was also negative or should be negative because the mass M2 mm -hmm. is losing mass. I'm saying something stupid at this moment. Is anybody here an expert in binary systems? I think. Uh, so what's the solution? Yeah, the story here is that. I ah, mean, it's it, not the, the radius of the star, right? It's, it's the, this is what I. This is the stupid thing I said. Yeah, this this moment. R two dot is defined that the it is the, from the. It is the the, the row slope radius. Yeah, so oh, okay. So what? happens is that the row slope is rising and star remains there. So then if the row slope is rising, then star is inside, loses contact, and the mass exchange stops. Right, right. Now we got it correctly. So the mass exchange stops. On the other hand, if the star evolves, by burning the, 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 the material in the nucleus, like, uh, for example, sun, the star slowly expands. Sun also expands. So if the star expands and if we uh, wait long enough, then it will get into the contact again. And in reality, of course, it is not uh, happening in steps but the, the rate of uh, flow will be then uh, governed by the nuclear burning time scale and the flow of the, of the mass will be slow. So there will be no, no rapid uh, mass transfer and nuclear burning time scale, those are, uh, for example, in the case of sun, this is comparable to the age of the universe. In the case of, of more massive stars, that's faster. Of course. On the other hand, if uh, Q is, is larger than uh, five, uh, six, then the opposite situation is, is true. So the row slope shrinks, oops, row slope shrinks, and then the star is really outside the row slope and it's just flowing immediately towards the, the uh, uh, companion. Of course, this immediately means just the external envelope. And then such situation uh, depends what is the, on, on what is the uh, stellar structure. Because then if star, star gets rid of the envelope, it has to somehow refill the envelope. So then, it depends whether the radiative, whether the envelope is, is uh, in radiative uh, balance or whether this envelope and uh, deeper zones are in uh, convective uh, balance. Because if it is radiative balance, then uh, the important the time scale is thermal time scale. Maybe we'll talk about it at some point. Why is that? In the case of a convective envelope, it means that you have dynamical motion of the, of the material, and then the flow can be in dynamical.
time scale. Excuse me. Yes. May I ask you about the uh, the previous slide? Uh, one one back. Yes. Yes. We use the conservation of the angular momentum. Yes. Uh, but that formula for the angular momentum does not contain the spin angular momentum of the two stars that are ah rotating. because we we assume it's unimportant. It is unimportant. Yes. Well, uh, in most it cases, changing. it in most cases it is unimportant because rarely star stars uh, rotate as fast as as to have. Uh, a Keplerian velocity at the equatorial plane. For example, take the, the rotation of the, star, of the sun. This is much, much slower than the Keplerian rotation. So th this is completely neglected. Of course, if you okay. want to do okay. it uh, properly for some B stars, particularly, you should start to worry about it. Yes, yeah, just but I'd, like, I'd like to add a comment on Lorenzo's yeah. point. Like, the spin is very important for like chemically homogeneous solutions, like when the star is very fast. So you mix the um, material very efficiently, so it doesn't expand. So the response to the radius decrease and increase the stellar surface will be very different compared to slowly rotating star. Mm -hmm. So you should care about this. Yeah, okay, okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we for the moment, we, we drop <laughs> those things because then we can get uh, semi-analytical uh, estimates, which are intuitive. But of course, if you want to do a good job, then you have to do it better. So to have some idea about those time scales for solar uh, type stars, this thermal time scale or Kelvin Hel Helmholtz time scale is of order of uh, 10 to 7 years. Uh, so then we can uh, estimate the accretion rate in such mechanism just uh, comparing the, the mass to the time scale and then we can uh, get the mass exchange rates uh, of the order of uh, 10 to minus 8 in solar masses per year. It's noticeable, but not, not dramatic. On the other hand, the dynamical time scale for the sun is, uh, I think, 13 hours. This is at least what I have as an estimate. And in that case, the accretion rate would be something like 10 to 3 solar masses per year if, if the star is compact. Mm -hmm. So in that case, the situation is dramatic. We will never discuss this kind of things because then there is no discussion about uh, accretion disk, anything. It's just dramatic event in the life of, 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 of the star. We will mention that in, uh, in the next uh, slide. Uh, so I was talking about accretion through this inner Lagrange point, and in most cases later during the uh, lectures when we are doing theory, we will concentrate on those cases because they are simpler. On the other hand, in principle, you can have also an accretion from stellar wind if you have this uh, companion star and none of those uh, stars feel the, the rush low, but uh, uh, the star is, is uh, losing mass. In the case of uh, main sequence stars, uh, mass loss is really negligible, so this would be of no interest. But there are stars like O or B type stars or Evolve and Giants, and they can have uh, mass loss uh, uh, of order of 10 to minus 5 uh, solar masses per year. Sometimes 10 to minus 4 solar masses per year. That's the, the, the record. Uh, on the other hand, only a fraction of, of a wind is usually intercepted. All depends on the separation dramatically on, on velocity. So the question, there is always a bow shock, maybe a disc will fall, maybe not. Usually it's, it's quite complicated. 
the most typical situation, and this is in Signal 6-1, is when, when the star is almost feeling the Roche law, and then uh, there is uh, wind accretion, but because the star is close to the Roche law, this is so-called focused wind, and it looks almost like an accretion through L1, but not quite. That's also more complicated. So now, when this thing happens, and uh, this is important as an information why, and we will uh, concentrate later on on very specific systems in our discussions of, of uh, accretion disk theory, because we will later talk about binary stars as well, as well, not just AGN, but mostly cataclysmic variables and low mass X-ray binaries because they are simple. So a few words, how they, they form. This is really pretty complicated. So I hope I will get the, the, the outline right, but if I'm doing something wrong, please correct me. I'm not really working in this business. So the evolution of the binaries sometimes, or actually always in those cases which are of interest for us, proceeds through two phases of mass, ex mass exchange. So first episode happens when we start to have a binary system, mass one, mass two, and of course at the beginning, mm, the star, which is more massive, evolves uh, faster and slowly starts to approach the, its Roche law. So before it, it uh, approaches this uh, Roche law, it uh, still forms a so-called detached system, so it's not yet in, in contact. And some symbiotic stars actually look like that. And it's uh, interesting that using uh, uh, VLT interferometry combined with uh, Pioneer, it is possible really to, 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 to map this star. So this is really the image. This is the picture which is drawn, you know, artistic pictures. And this is really the, 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 the giant, which is almost feeling the Roshlop, and this is the main sequence star. This is, of course, an image which is reconstructed from interferometric image. So it's not as simple, and it's not doing just snapshot, but interferometry works like, like this. So then finally, the, the uh, this uh, giant and type star feels its Roche law. It, the system becomes semi-detached. And the, this, uh, the fact how fast the, the, the transfer of the mass will happen depends on the initial masses and initial period. And it's quite complicated classification. Case A is when the envelope is radiated. So the envelope of the star is radiated. I mentioned already that uh, because in this case, well, we have the massive star losing the mass. So then this is this rapid mass transfer. But in the case of radiative envelope, this is this ma rapid mass transfer in thermal time scale. So it's not yet the most dramatic uh, event. But of course, the flow of the mass is quite uh, uh, fast and it uh, finishes when the system reverses the mass ratio. So this, the system during this period is characterized by uh, considerable change of orbit. Of course, both uh, stars are large, so the stream hits the star directly, there is no match of a disk. Uh, 
In Polish Wikipedia, there is a very nice movie which uh, shows the, the Lira type uh, star, how it evolves. This is the, the, the snapshot, but if we see the e eclipses, then we can detect the, the geometry of the, of the system. It's interesting that usually uh, English Wikipedia is better, but in that case, the movie is only in the Polish version and not in the English version. For some reason, probably the author put it there. <laughs> So later uh, evolution can also form a contact binary, for example, when those two stars are actually touching each other. Case B is when the contact actually happens later. So again, the evolution is in terms of Helmholtz time scale because the uh, of the radiative envelope, but the star is more advanced in the in the uh, structure changes in the in the burning, and it's already after contraction of the of the helium nucleus, so it has extended uh, the envelope and uh, smaller helium nucleus. And again, it depends on, on two cases. Either the mass is larger than three solar masses or mass is smaller. If mass is, is larger, then star uh, starts to, to, to burn helium and uh, forms a Volparaia star. Or if it is less massive, then the nucleus finally forms a dwarf, uh, white dwarf, so-called, inside and burning proceeds only in the envelope, and then we uh, have an algal system. And finally, we have a white dwarf on a large orbit. The system, after the, the loss of the, of the envelope, the system gets detached. Mm -hmm. There is case B2 and C. <coughs> When the star is already so evolved that the uh, envelope is convective and mass exchange happens in a dynamical way, accretion rate is much, much higher than the Eddington ratio. Uh, and still a white dwarf will form well somewhere deeply inside the, the, the Rosh law. But this very dramatic period leaves important consequence on what is happening because this mass exchange is happening so rapidly that at some point we are passing through some stage like a common envelope. So because the, 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 the receiving star cannot digest all this mass, right? So everything becomes enshrouded in a huge mass of, of material. And this is really very badly understood uh, stage. So the, the, the main idea was, was proposed many years ago. This is uh, not very elegant picture, but it was made in already in 70s. And people imagine something like that, because the problem is that we want to, to form low mass X-ray binaries. And look at the schematic uh, drawing of a low mass X-ray binary, the most extreme case. This has orbital period 11 minutes. It consists of neutron star and the white dwarf. This is the separation radius, and this is the surface of the sun, well, a fraction, sun is huge. So you cannot evolve two huge stars 10 times or 100 times uh, larger even than the sun in such space. This is not the original orbit, right? The origin, it, it had to shrink many orders of magnitude. And the answer is common envelope. And the answer is how precisely it happened 
the answer is nobody knows. Right? Oh, you know. Okay. So, what, <laughs> like, uh, what if the neutron star got a kick like during its birth? It can also reduce the orbital size. Well, but if you do a spectacular kick, the, the most uh, probable outcome will be that you, uh, that it will escape, right? It will not be bound. Yeah, so, it be so, yes, it's <laughs> actually very, still very difficult to, to preserve it at some point where it was. So you, usually we think that first we form here a white dwarf and then a neutron star forms through supernova 1A event or something like that, relatively quietly, not uh, through some other dramatical event. But it, it's, it's, it's tricky because it's easier, I think, to, 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 to disrupt the binary than, than to keep the thing where it should be. On the other hand, you know, this system is really well observed, well studied. I, 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 we don't have a photo, but we have orbital periods and everything. And it's as small as that. and had to be made through this common envelope stage. Um, I wanted to ask, so, of course, so the, in the system, the the angular momentum is, is conserved as such. But, uh, well, in simple, uh, but in simple analytical uh, expressions, this is what I assume. On the other really? hand, no, no. Of course, particularly in that case, it's no, no, and again, no for the angular momentum. You have to get rid of this angular momentum because you have to shrink this loose orbit to get something like that tiny and you have to get rid of 99.99% of angular momentum. You can have outflow from this system, yes. Right? So yes. Uh, yes, because at some point you get rid of this of this common envelope. And this common envelope has to carry the angular momentum. So then you cannot do any play with this conservative evolution yeah. here. At this stage of the evolution depends on magnetic field of stars and everything else. Convection and, and, the, and the, gas, the gas drag is probably negligible, like when there is common and whole bomb this school. I, I think it's not negligible. I think it's not negligible mm. in that case because the envelope is dense. Mm. So it's really very difficult 3D MHD problem. Mm. People are working on that, but you know. They are working. Nobody claims that the, the, the problem is solved. Okay, so we end up with uh, uh, two stars, usually in uh, detached uh, system, like uh, main sequence star, which uh, was uh, less massive at the beginning, so it was not evolved. And then uh, white dwarf as a secondary star. And then the, the, the second star, this main sequence star, which was not evolved, now starts to evolve. And now this star will finally feel the, the Roche law and will start to accrete. And now we are entering into the second mass exchange phase. So is, uh, here we can, so we can have, uh, for example, setup like this, this main sequence star, this uh, flow through the inner Lagrange point, white dwarf with the accretion disk here. And this is uh, how uh, cataclysmic variables look like. On the other hand, you can have here a neutron star as well. Mm. And in that case, you will have a low mass X-ray binary. You can have a black hole mass here and then explanation how it happened that this still is a system is still alive. It's a good question. But you know, this is how low mass uh, X-ray binaries with black holes look like. This is what we know. How it happened, 
somehow it happens. Of course, we, we can have uh, also the situation when, when the star is uh, uh, still about to be feeling the, the, the Roche uh, lobe, and this is uh, in the in the case of uh, Cygnus X1, when this is, uh, other star is more, more massive than it's an O-type star, and then we can have this wind accretion again onto a, a neutron star or a black hole, whatever. Then it would be a high mass X-ray binary. So to get into this uh, second contact, we need still to lose the angular momentum, right? Because we end, the, we finish the evolution when the, those two stars are, are detached. And that's quite interesting uh, because there are two mechanisms which allow for uh, efficient uh, loss of angular momentum. One is gravitational radiation. If you have already compact system, gravitational radiation is important. But also magnetic, uh, magnetic wind is important and that is usually referred to in this context as magnetic uh, breaking. This can carry away angular momentum. That's more difficult to uh, to predict, but gravitational radiation that will uh, work for sure. So uh, arguments for the existence of gravitational waves uh, appeared much much before the gravitational waves were detected. So uh, you probably know that the argument. Uh, which came from Hals, uh, Taylor, uh, Pulsar, but the same year, Paczynski and Sienkiewicz published their paper on the binary evolution where they really needed also gravitational radiation. So for, for, to, to astronomers, the detection of gravitational waves was not such a fantastic thing. We, we believe they are. Now we, we think it's great because it's a great tool, right, to understand a lot of process, to get the equation of state for a neutron star, to get statistics of, of black hole masses, etc., etc. But I don't think that anybody in, in astronomy had any doubts before that gravitational waves do exist. Of course they, they, they do, they are needed. So as I mentioned, we, we produce neutron star probably through the supernova 1A outburst from the initial white dwarf when it accretes, it can, uh, its, its mass can become larger than the Chandra Sekar mass. On the other hand, there are some doubts about this mechanism either. So I will not concentrate on that. And now I would like to, to talk more about AGNs for a change but also not about the, 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 the structure, but about the origin of the, of the mass. And that's difficult, really. If you thought that the previous thing is difficult, then this is really difficult, not for mathematics, but for conceptually, you will see. So, of course, in that case, we don't have a second star. We have just a nucleus, and nucleus is inside the, the, the galaxy. And stars in the galaxy are on stable orbits, right? Our sun is not falling towards Sagittarius A star, and it's not going to fall in predictable future. And the same is for, for, for gas in spiral arms. It's not fall, falling inside. So how to get any, any star? Already many, many years ago, I think Hughes was the first who proposed it in 1975, that, uh, well, most of the stars will not fall towards the center, but from time to time, stars have close encounters between themselves, and then one star occasionally can be directed towards the center of the nucleus. And if such a star is, is flowing towards the central black hole of the mass of 10 to 6 or 10 to 8 solar masses, 
then this star will be disrupted and we'll have a fresh arrival of, of material. This was much more elaborated by, by Martin Rees and he uh, estimated that uh, in a given galaxy this event can happen every 10,000 10, years. So every 10,000 years you can expect uh, uh, one solar or few solar masses. It's not a huge inflow of the mass, but still something. So Rees uh, actually estimated uh, uh, quite carefully what, what happens. He even estimated that this uh, kind of a disk will form, but only uh, a fraction of the material will form the uh, disk, and the remaining has to carry away the angular uh, part of the angular momentum and mostly energy, so this will be uh, unbound, this will be still bound, and maybe it will return along the elliptical uh, orbit, so it will uh, create a messy situation, but uh, well, we will have a kind of event. Of course, the, the, the star has to pass very close to the black hole in order to get the disruption, and the criterion for the disruption of a star is that the mean density of the star has to be lower than the black hole mass divided by the distance from the black hole mass. So it will be a homework to, to derive this kind of equation. So this uh, disruption really happens at the distance of few Schwarzschild radii, typically from the black hole. As a result, the predicted event, brightening and accretion rate, lasts about a year as for the order of magnitude. So the prediction was, was made many years ago. It took some 10 years, I think, to get the first detection that was done by Comosa and Bade in 99. They noticed uh, brightenings and then the dimming in two uh, previously non-active galaxies and the dimming was more or less expected with the predictions of the, of the basic model which was given here. So these tidal uh, disruptions uh, do happen from time to time. We now know at least 40 cases, maybe more, maybe I, I did not check that. I, I think 40 was uh, a year ago, maybe something more is, is already now available. In some cases, uh, this detection was done in X-rays because the material was quite hot. But in some cases, you, you see even gamma ray emission from such uh, disruption because a jet temporarily uh, forms. This is the first event detected in gamma rays. It's a swift, uh, quite long uh, number. But, uh, you know, this event lasts a year, so you can support the activity for, for a year or so but it's not uh, uh, for quasar, right? Because then you need a consistent high accretion rate. So what else can we do? Of course, those predictions that uh, uh, event happens every 10 to four years was done for normal quiet uh, galaxies, not undergoing any dramatic events, but we know that there are galaxy mergers and they were Mm, uh, much more frequent in the past, and I was uh, mentioned. Uh, I, I mentioned already in the previous lecture that we have some kind of relation between the black hole mass and the bulge mass of the galaxy. So somehow, uh, the galaxy is uh, governing. The, the black hole mass or, or the other way around. Some people propose that maybe the merger scheme actually is responsible for this kind of, of relation, which is now here plotted kind of 
qualitatively because it's a nice nice picture so maybe if the if the galaxy is strongly disturbed because it is in the merger process then uh, this kind of uh, stellar encounters happens more frequently on the other hand, it's not really that likely that we actually accrete stars. Most likely, we accrete gas. That looks much better. And what is really important is that the accreting material in quasars is always of high metallicity, solar or supersolar metallicity. Even if you look at a quasar, at 7.5, I already mentioned it's a problem to get such a large black hole mass, but it's another problem to get all those metals because there are no, no hydrogen pure quasars. If you look at a quasar, you see carbon-4, magnesium-2, OCNO, silicates as well, whatever. So you, you, you need to process somehow the, the material first, and then somehow you have to get really this, this material closer to the black hole, but we, we do not see that in quasars directly. We can think about hot material accretion. We know that we have a, a lot of hot plasma we, uh, this is the, the map of the X-rays, the, the, the map of the Sagittarius A star in X-rays, but in the case of elliptical galaxies or clusters of galaxies, we know that there is a lot of, of, of hot material. So in principle, this material, if it cools, then this material could settle onto the central black hole. And we will talk about spherical accretion uh, during the next lecture, if I remember correctly. On the other hand, in the case of Sagittarius A star, if you, if you do computations, you do not see the velocity field because this is just, you know, Bremstralo. So you don't have the signature of, uh, of velocity. But estimates clearly show that actually only a small fraction of this material is flowing in and the rest is flowing out. So it does not want to flow in. So it's a problem. So we really need observational evidences for cold gas inflow. This would make us happy. Do we have this? Well, active and non-active galaxies were studied with relatively high resolution many times in the past. This is a kind of more oldish picture taken in, in 94 and uh, there is a nucleus here. This is a famous Seifert 2 galaxy, NGC 1068. You see a lot of, of clumps of the, of, of, of the gas, uh, dust, UV emission, but all that is at the distance of one kiloparsec from the nucleus. And it's not flowing in, it looks like a ring. We have now much better instruments. This is the, the, the picture uh, uh, taken in uh, this year, 2019. Fantastic data, the best you can have. Right? People were using Muse instrument and a number of other uh, instruments and they they looked at uh, stars and uh, gas in H alpha line. So they can resolve the, 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 the region a bit better, but still it's 2.5 kiloparsec, this is the thing. So what, here is the velocity map. Blue means uh, uh, one direction of uh, velocity, red means the other direction. So what is this stupid thing doing? It's rotating, right? It's just rotating. 
Here on this map, they say that uh, we see some maybe spiral arms, whatever, but on the, on the velocity field, you also predominantly see rotation. The stupid thing does not want to fall in. We can go closer to a fraction of a parsec. And that can be done using observations in radio of water maser. This was, this is really fantastic data. This was taken mm -hmm. for NGC 4258. Uh, it was detected already in 90s. This is the, the, the plot from 99. And in that case, because you have uh, uh, VLBI observations in, in radio, you can uh, really resolve the emission. So what you see are clumps of emission localized like here in space. Because of, of the interferometry, this is resolved in space. But because this is really very narrow line of water, you also see the position of the line. So from the Doppler shift, you see the velocity. And then you can recover the velocity field. This is how they draw the, 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 the shape. So what you see, roughly a Keplerian motion with a bit of a twist. And that's it. You do not see inflow. You see Keplerian motion. And looking at the newer data will not help. On the other hand, it's a really very useful source. You can determine Hubble constant from it. Uh, Supernova 1A people use this source for calibration. Fantastic thing, but it does not show the outflow, the inflow. For the broadline region, I already showed you this, this picture. We now resolve the broadline region, but here again in this broadline region, we actually see the Keplerian rotation. We do not see the inflow from the broadline region. Occasionally, when we analyze the shapes of the, of the uh, lines in the broadline region, we may have arguments for inflow or outflow, whatever, but this is strongly, um, and this is not really reliable because it depends on the, on the radiative transfer, which is not really done. So, as a result, we don't know how AGNs are powered. But they are powered. That's the only answer I can, I can tell you. And even in, in, in the case of the Milky Way, we have the highest uh, spatial resolution of the situation and still we are not sure what is happening. So right now the, the uh, level of activity is, is pretty low. I mentioned to you that we have some, some players, the black hole mass of course is, is measured from those stars and those stars are uh, losing also, uh, uh, they, they have stellar winds. So a fraction of this uh, wind is, is flowing towards uh, Sagittarius A star but from, from uh, estimates, we, we see that most of this material is actually flowing uh, away. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't remember if I mentioned to you, yes, I think I did mention that some 10,000 years ago, Sagittarius A star, a few hundred years ago, Sagittarius A star was, was more active. Uh, on the other hand, we do not see immediately a lot of material which was responsible for what happened 400 years ago. We have here some streams. Here we have mini spiral. Here we have a ring, dusty molecular ring. Those mini spirals, they have velocity, material flows in this direction and the estimated ages of this is 10,000 years. So no obvious reason what happened 400 years ago. No obvious remnants, right? 
Every time you say star was also very, very active uh, uh, millions of years ago when it produced uh, Fermi bubbles, but then perhaps this was related somehow to this ring. But the event which happened for 400 years ago, we, we cannot detect what, what, what happened. Why was it really stellar disruption? It was longer than stellar disruption, single star disruption. Nobody knows. So even in the case of Sagittarius A star, if you, we want to answer how it was powered in the past, we don't know. Currently, it can it is powered by uh, mostly stellar winds. So this is a problem for for classification because uh, we would like to have classification based, for example, on the way how material arrives or on, on some physical background, right? But for the moment. What we have in AGN is just a zoology. So we divide them into radio load or radio quiet, and then radio load into bright or less bright, then radio quiet again into bright and less bright, and really much, much less bright. And then those separate galaxies, which are intermediately bright, they are divided into narrow line separate ones proper separate ones and separate tools, which are divided into proper separate tools or not proper separate tools. And then additionally, we should locate here blazers, BLRs, that's not quite the same, uh, because blazers divide into BLRs and uh, whatever it is. Yes, and then we have weak line quasars and changing look AGN, which cannot make their mind where they are. And that's more or less for now. So during the next lecture, we will try to fight with theory and see whether we can get some understanding from the theoretical point of view. Okay, thank you. Ah, homework. <laughs> ah, okay, thank you. Yes, yes, I have it on C on my slide and it's even translated this time. So it's to, to derive those formula which I did not derive.